Hey guys, welcome back. So today's part two on this 8,500 watt Lifen generator. And as you can tell, part one ended in the complete disassembly of this machine, which was expected. I bought this as a parts machine. It had engine issues. Specifically, the engine was stuck or at least almost completely stuck. You could get it to rotate, but only with extreme force. So, you know, I took this apart, really just looking to harvest the parts on it, like this generator head, the fuel tank, and everything that was connected externally to that engine. Anyway, once I got the engine open, I was kind of surprised at what I saw. Things looked very clean. Uh, the piston looked good. Cylinder looked good. Really, everything visually looked to be in great shape. The ultimate issue was the connecting rod. When you put that connecting rod onto the crankshaft and just finger tighten the bolts, it is frozen on the crank. So something happened, not sure what, but I think a new connecting rod would fix this issue. And to that end, I took a look online. No surprise, Lifen doesn't have a parts diagram, never mind parts. And this engine has no identifying information on it. So it's a bit of a guessing game, but Generator Guru does sell a connecting rod for this for $90. And I also checked eBay. I found one that might work for 18 bucks. So I ordered that one. It'll be here in a few days. So what I want to do now is get everything cleaned up and prepped and ready for reassembly. Uh, but first, I want to check this crankshaft journal. Potentially the issues with that, you know, I do see there was some aluminum transfer, so that needs to be cleaned off. And I want to measure it up. You know, I don't know what the standard size is on this, but I can at least check it to see if it's out of round. So I'm going to start there. Let me get you set up a little better and get going on this. Right, I'm going to use this digital micrometer to measure things up. I'm going to start first from left to right. That is the area usually of less wear. We'll record that number and then we'll check from top to bottom and make sure they're the same. Now, they will be a bit different if it's more than about a thousandth, maybe a thousandth and a half different than the cranks out around and can't be used. All right, let's see where we're at. One point four one six six five. Get the same there. One point four one six seven. One point four one six six five. One point four one six six five. Sorry, one point four one five five. One point four one six four. So let me write these down and we'll take a closer look. And the results are in. And they're pretty good. Uh, from left to right, starting on the PTO side, you can see the largest discrepancy is one ten thousandth of an inch. And top to bottom, not quite as good, but not too bad. We see a two ten thousandth discrepancy. So I'd say we have a good crankshaft. Let's get that aluminum cleaned off that crank. All right, to clean this aluminum off, I'm gonna use some muriatic acid. Uh, to do that, I'm just gonna soak this cloth in the acid, we'll wrap it around the journal, let it sit for five or 10 minutes. This one's not gonna take long to clean up. There's not much aluminum on there. Uh, when I'm done, we'll neutralize it with baking soda, and then I'm gonna sand it a bit with 1500 grit, 3000 grit, 
and then put some oil on there to keep it from flash rusting. Okay, we're at the 10 minute mark. All right, and for this, I'm actually gonna start with 800 grit just to get the rest of that off. It only takes about a second. I'm gonna wet sand it with some WD-40, and then we'll move on to the 1500 and then the 3000. Yeah, not bad. Um, might do that for a few more seconds and then move on. Yeah, that's more like it. So now the 1500. Yeah, it's coming out pretty good. I'm gonna keep going with the 3000 grit a little bit longer. I wanna get that finish as much of a mirror as possible. I'm also gonna hit the journals a little bit right here, and especially here. Um, I'm reusing the oil seals, they're in good condition, but with this buildup of junk here, you know, I could damage those seals when reinstalling. All right, now for the head. Honestly, it's not that bad. The carbon buildup is minimal. Uh, most likely, this would run just fine without causing any issues. But since we have it off, we might as well decarbon this and we'll lap the valves in. Uh, you can tell too, the, the head gasket was blown. The combustion was coming out the side here. So I have a new head gasket on the way. And as far as what I use to clean this, uh, usually for the, the mating surface here around the edge, I use a plastic Rolock brush made by 3M. It is made for cleaning head gasket material off of cars and it's safe or safer to use on aluminum than most other things. So that's what I'll use here. As far as the carbon in here, this is a lot more stubborn. I will usually resort to a stainless steel brush, uh, which works well, but you know, you do take a risk. If the bristles break off and they do, if you leave one in there when the, in, when the engine's running, it's going to cause some pretty bad damage. So in the hardware store the other day, I walked by this and hadn't seen this before. So I picked one up. It is a nylon bristle brush and it's embedded with some aluminum oxide for grit. So I'm going to try that in here, see if it's strong enough to break off this carbon, see if it works.
Yeah, that's working pretty well. Yeah, overall not too bad. I think that brush worked uh, pretty well for getting most of that carbon off. And actually the Scotch-Brite did a very good job on the ceiling surface. Uh, this right here actually seems to be a manufacturing error. It's just a low spot in the aluminum, but it's in a spot where it's not going to cause any issue. All right, so to get the valves out, this looks pretty easy. I don't even think I need a valve spring compressor for this. Let's try the exhaust. Just put a towel under there to keep the valve from dropping while trying to push the spring. Yeah, not too bad. So first I'm going to clean these valves up. Just going to spin it in a drill. And hold some Scotch-Brite on it. Yeah, see how that exhaust spins? I'm just pushing down with light pressure. It shouldn't spin. So that valve definitely needs to be lapped. Uh, the intake isn't so bad.
Yeah, perfect. It no longer spins, so it's making good contact with the seat. So we'll just repeat the same process here on the intake. Perfect. There is an issue here. Uh, in part one of this video, I thought the exhaust valve looked odd. And now that I'm looking at it, I can see there is a problem. If you look at these retainer caps, especially where it goes around the valve, they are different. This one is recessed, and it really looks like a rotator cap should be there, uh, but there's not. And I've looked through the engine. I don't see any signs of a rotator cap. So Either someone took it off or it fell off and went into the engine, and that's what led to the damage to the connecting rod. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of research to see where I can get this. This is a Honda clone, so I'm guessing a GX390 rotator cap will probably work, uh, but I'm not sure. Okay, I just ordered rotator caps for a Honda GX390. I think they'll fit but I won't know till they get here. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just continuing cleaning. And now that I know the rotator cap basically was ingested by this engine, it just makes cleaning that much more important. So I've already spent a bunch of time cleaning the crank, the head, the camshaft, the counterweight in the kitchen sink with soap and water. So they've been blown dry, re-oiled. I think we're good there really just have the block left. And for that, I'm gonna bring it outside. We'll attack it with the garden hose, some dish soap, and just try to get every bit of metal out of the ball bearings and the engine block. This is the governor here. It's actually pretty cool how it works, spraying it with water. You can see this pup up and feel the force. It's actually pretty strong.
And I blew everything dry, and I did give everything a light coat of WD-40, but I'm going to actually apply some motor oil into the parts that are more likely to rust just to protect them. The rotator cap showed up today. This is for a Honda GX390. So I'm just gonna pop this valve off, make sure it fits on the stem properly, as well as the retainer. It fits well on the stem. And the retainer, so this should work. Let's uh, try installing it. That's it. And then there's the frame. Uh, there's still a few days before I get the rest of the parts. So I've taken some time, just sanded off all the rust, degreased it, and you saw me power wash it earlier. So it's about as prepped as it's gonna get. So I'm just gonna put some paint on it now, and that'll give it a few days to cure. Okay, new connecting rod showed up in the mail today. And at first glance, it appears to be the right part. Now it is different. There are some differences on it. So it's made most likely by a different company, but doesn't mean it's not gonna fit. Anyway, I'm gonna put this on the crank, just snug it down. I'm not gonna torque it all the way. I wanna make sure it's not binding on the crank. And if we're good there, then I'm gonna get some plastic gauge out and we'll measure the actual clearance between the new connecting rod and this crankshaft. It feels pretty good. So let's try it with the plastic gauge. We'll torque it down. I don't have the spec on this, but I'm gonna use the Rato engine manual for a 420cc clone Honda. And in that manual, they call for 18 Newton meters, which translates into about 159 inch pounds.
To do this check, I'm just going to use some plastic gauge, the green, which can measure clearances between one and three thousandths. The idea is you just break off a piece of this, lay it across the journal, and then torque down on the connecting rod. And the more it gets smushed, the smaller the clearance. So that's a thousandth, one and a half thousandths, two thousandths, and three thousandths. Now, I don't have the spec on this, but given the size of this journal, I would expect the standard clearance to be around a thousandth, potentially one and a half thousand. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'd say we could probably go up to two and a half thousands before we're in reject territory. So let's see where we're at. So not three thousandths. Close to two thousandths. And not one and a half thousandths. So it's somewhere between one and a half and two thousandths, probably closer to two. This should be fine. Do a quick reality check on the other side. 1.999. The old one. About the same. Yeah. Make sure it's in the groove.
On this engine, the arrow goes down. Huh. That is so close. It almost clears it. Anyway, that's the issue right there. The bottom bolt actually clears it without issue. So either I need to modify this crankcase or potentially just grind a little bit off that end of the bolt to give it the clearance that we need. All right, I decided to modify the bolt. You can see there's a ridge running around here and that adds about an extra millimeter in thickness to this bolt. Uh, the old one didn't have that and the old bolt does fit, but it's not quite as long. So I think I'd rather modify this one and use the longer bolt. Okay, hopefully that does it. You can see I took a lot off. We have about five millimeters left. The original bolts on the original connecting rod, the clearance was 5.9. So even at 5.9, the new bolt with the new connecting rod wouldn't fit. So now it's closer to five millimeters. I don't wanna take much more off, so I'm gonna fit it in and see if we clear. And we do. It is so close though, but it shouldn't be an issue. I mean, the max play we're gonna have is probably two thousandths of an inch. I'm gonna put the end cover on. I just wanna make sure that, you know, the alignment of the crank doesn't change at all. Yeah, I think we're good.
All right, I think we're just about there. Everything is timed properly. So I'm going to degrease and put the cover on.
All right, the plot thickens. That should not move like that. I mean, it should have a little bit of play, like this one. You can see this can move quite a ways away from the valve itself, and that's going to change the clearance, and it's going to allow this retainer to pop out. So the only thing keeping that alignment in place is actually this plate down here. And on this side, uh, the push rod wore the plate, which is what allowed this to move in the first place, losing the cap and destroying the connecting rod. So I'm not quite ready to finish putting this together. I do need to find a replacement plate. The part I've been waiting for showed up today. This was advertised for a Honda GX390. This is actually a clone part. This is a clone engine, so hoping it's going to fit. Uh, the kit also came with new rockers and new studs, which we don't need. So let's get these rockers off. We'll get the plate out and go from there. And you can really see here the damage. If you look on the right, that's what it's supposed to look like. Here on the left, you can tell this side all got chewed up and is missing quite a bit of material. Anyway, the new one seems like it's a match. So let's give it a try. Yeah, that's, that's the way it should be. So I think we're good here. I still need to adjust the valves, but I want to get the flywheel on first. It'll make it easier to rotate the engine. We'll set the clearance and then throw this cap on and finish this up. And I've got the piston at the bottom of the stroke. I'm gonna fill the cylinder with rope. That'll essentially lock it up. And then I can torque down the flywheel nut to 100 foot pounds.
It occurs to me. I mean, this plate has to be on. So that's where the governor spring attaches. This is also for the cooling. But I can't put it on until the exhaust is installed. And I can't install the exhaust until the generator head's installed. And I don't want to install the generator head until I've tested the engine. So I might finish tightening this up uh, just so we can get the governor spring attached. And I might have to test it without the exhaust because I don't think it makes much sense to put that generator head on until I know for sure that we have a good engine. This here is the idle solenoid. This is full throttle like this, and when this actuates, it pushes the throttle closed until it hits the idle set screw on the carburetor. Anyway, it seems a little sticky. So, not sure if it works. And as far as the carburetor goes, I'm tempted to just bolt this on and give it a try, but it is pretty dirty. And yeah, I don't know what the inside looks like. So I'm at least going to drop the bowl. We'll take a peek inside and make a call. Not terrible, but the bowl is dirty. Uh, the inside looks decent, but given what I see in the bowl, I think I'm going to give this a quick clean before putting it on this engine. All right, change a plan. I'm not going to clean the carburetor right now. This video is actually getting quite long, so I think this is going to be part two of three. But I don't want to end it quite yet. I want to hear this engine run. So I think... The best move here is to get this off the bench and we'll get it reinstalled onto the frame. You know, I've re-added the wheel kit, the handles, and the engine mounts. So we'll drop that in, bolt the engine down, put a little fuel down the spark plug hole and give that cord a pull. Compression feels too high. Yeah, I just pulled this over by hand and the compression feels higher than it should be. You know, I double checked the valve clearance. We're still pretty good. So there's really only two possibilities here. Either that rotator cap isn't the right part or potentially there's something wrong with the compression release. I'm not really sure. Anyway, I've had bad experiences trying to start engines with high compression. Ow. Ow. So I rigged up the electric start. Vice Grip Garage would be proud. Anyway, it can crank it with the battery without issue. So 
maybe I'm being a baby, but I don't want to take any chances. So let's dump some fuel down the spark plug hole and give it a go. All right, well, that was disappointing. Uh, we got a little bit of flame at the intake and the exhaust. I saw a lot of fuel spraying out unignited, so I'm wondering if we have a spark issue. Uh, let's get the plug out, we'll get the spark tester on and see what that looks like. All right, well, there's your problem. That light was barely lighting up, and I only saw intermittent spark on the spark plug. So, yeah, that's not going to work. And this is at atmospheric pressure. Once you put that plug in and it tries to spark under compression, you need more voltage than you would in normal atmosphere like this. So chances are it's performing even worse when installed. So... I think we need a new coil. I do have the kill switch completely disconnected, so there's nothing killing that coil. I think that coil is bad. That could also be the problem. It's a torch. Anyway, this one's not much better. It's a no-name brand, but let's see. Yeah, and I see absolutely nothing from that plug. So, I think we need a new coil. Okay, I've got a new coil installed. And I've got the old one right here. I actually want to do an ohms test on it. You know, I'm curious to see what the ohms are on a bad coil uh, versus a good one. You know, I've only tested one of these types of coils before. And it came in at around 10,000 ohms, which... Seemed a little high, but that was a working coil on a Honda clone. So let's test the bad one, see where it's at, and then we'll test the good. All right, to do this test, you just put your meter into ohms. You put one lead on the spark plug wire and the other one anywhere on a clean piece of metal. And you can see this coil comes in at 12,000 ohms. Let's check the good one. Yeah, and the good one's at 10,000 ohms. So that's a quick, easy way to check the health of a coil. Uh, usually it's pretty accurate. I mean, if you do that test and it stays at open lead, or the number's really low or really high, it's pretty clear cut. In this case, you know, we're talking a difference of 2,000 ohms on whether it's good or bad. All right, and I realized earlier I completely glossed over the high compression issue. 
You know, I was a little bit anxious just to get this thing running so that I could hear what it sounds like. Anyway, I've had a chance to slow down a bit. I've got the compression tester hooked up. I'm just going to turn this engine over and we can see what the compression comes in at. Usually with the compression release, you're going to see about 60 PSI. And I think you can see we're at about 110 PSI. So I'm glad the starter can turn that over. I wouldn't want to try pull starting that one. Nice. We've got a runner, and I've got to say, I started to have my doubts, but you know, the engine sounds good. So I think the only issue left really to deal with is the decompression system. So we'll take a closer look at that in part three, uh, but for now, I'm done. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.